thank you thank you so much yeah so it, it's about it will start at 11:30 yes 11:30 okay okay so this is a student chapter of your college uh, or is this uh, something within bombay i mean the chapter is in bombay uh, it's a student chapter uh, but it comes under ipli bombay section okay okay nice ma'am yeah uh, so how many uh, like is it triply or uh, ec you offer all the courses here uh this is electronics and telecommunication uh, department okay okay yeah. but uh, the uh, symposium is open for everyone okay sounds good yeah i saw there were two talks yesterday and one afterwards also some yes there is yes so i, I think those are more technical so i'll be morely uh, <clears throat> mostly giving a session on what we have been doing in 5g from the last 6 7 years yeah. right so we also wanted someone to give us a perspective as to what is the status in india and you know how are we uh, progressing forward so great excellent i will do that i mean that's exactly what we have been doing yeah right yeah so it i we thought it's important that you know we should have that perspective as well yeah i mean there, there is uh, some people think india is not doing much but uh, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes so. correct yes yeah. So it's good for us to be aware of what's happening in our country. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Apart so you offer the... MTech, PhD, everything. This year. Sorry, for, uh, sorry, sir. You offer you offer masters and PhD, everything, or what? what no, kind we are of... an under undergraduate, undergraduate. Uh, college. Yes. So I'll be on mute, ma'am. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you.
Hello and good morning. I would like to welcome our speaker for the day, Dr. Saidi Rajamburu, along with all the participants. Welcome to the day two of our uh, symposium on 5G. Where do we stand in terms of 5G implementation at the moment? This is the question which all the billion eager consumer minds have in their uh, and swayed by the vision of 5G India and its life-changing promises. In this session, we deep dive into India's twist with 5G so far. How ready are we with 5G technology and 5G network in it? And what will the future bring for us? The speaker for the session, as I mentioned, is Dr. Saidhi Raj Amiru. He is a researcher interested in design and analysis of wireless communication systems. Currently, he is Principal Research Engineer with Quasic Networks at IIT Hyderabad, where he is involved with algorithm design and development for 4G and 5G. Also, he is an adjunct Assistant Professor at IIT Hyderabad, where he teaches courses and leads the physical layer system design, algorithm design, and research part of the 5G testbed project. He was awarded the Exemplary Reviewer Award for 2019 IEEE Wireless Communication Letters Journal and has also won the Best Paper Award Honorable Mention at the Comsnet 2020. Previously, he was a 3GPP uh, RAN1 delegate representing Samsung R&D India and involved in 3GPP 5G NR Layer 1 standardization activities. He has made significant contributions to the NR layer one specifications in the areas of initial access, random access, frame structure, bandwidth part, and beam management. For this work, which resulted in several standard accepted patients, uh, patents, he was given the IP Creator Award for the year 2017. At Samsung, he has also led research activities related to applications of machine learning for wireless communication problems. In his PhD research, he has used tools from statistical signal processing, optimization theory, statistical learning theory, and stochastic geometry to develop optimal attack strategies against wireless networks across physical, MAC, and network layers. Prior to his PhD, he has uh, worked as a modem engineer with Qualcomm, where he worked on radio frequency drivers for his modem chips. At Qualcomm, he was given several Qualstar awards for excellent performance across various projects and developments of RF drivers for a new chipset based on WCDMA. In this session, he will cover the journey of 5G in India starting from 2016, along with Indian efforts in the standardization at IPU, 3GPP, and TSDSI. At the end, he would also like to discuss the various R&D efforts being supported by various government organizations to propel India forward. On behalf of the Department of EXTC and all the participants, I welcome you, sir, and I would now like to take you to take over. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so can I start sharing my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, ma'am, for the nice introduction. Uh, yes, so uh, I, today I will uh, uh, try to talk about what we have been doing with respect to 5G. Uh, not now, but uh, our journey started uh, long, long ago. Uh, actually, the research part of the 5G started in India almost in 2009 and 2010. And... Uh, so uh, for every standard, uh, there's a big life cycle uh, that has to be taken care. So research happens almost five to six years before the standards are developed. And once the standards are developed, it easily takes another few years uh, before products are developed. And uh, quite different to 2G, 3G, 4G, India has uh, done quite a bit uh, with respect to 5G research, development, as well as deployments. I will shed light on all of these aspects. Uh, not many of you may know about this. Uh, people may think India is not doing much, but uh, I've been giving this talk, I mean, uh, so purely to change the mindset of people across uh, and that things are possible in India and great things are possible in India. And uh, I, I will not shy away from saying that uh, this is uh, 
this has become immensely possible only with the government of India support. Without uh, uh, such a government support and uh, thrust that we have seen not just within India, all, also when we participate in international organizations representing India, there's a huge support from our uh, country, uh, which has helped us uh, do something uh, important for India. So, uh, so what I will do is firstly, I'll generally tell what, why India perspective is important for uh, operators like Geo, Airtel or uh, equipment manufacturers like Ericsson, Nokia, uh, what, what is it about? Then uh, I'll give you a standards overview, standards. So for instance, Spectrum is an open resource. Anyone and everyone can use uh, Spectrum, right? So you, you cannot do whatever you want uh, with respect to Spectrum. You have to be extremely careful. Uh, about how you radiate uh, in this uh, spectrum. Uh, so that's why spectrum, uh, for instance, uh, the cellular bands are uh, quite costly because you there are uh, certain standards you have to follow. No, anyone, uh, like random people cannot do random things. You'll have to be extremely careful. So that's why there's a huge discussion that goes about auctioning of the spectrum. What is the base price, reserve price of the spectrum? Uh, and that if that's a value is actually relevant for that, the technology that is being developed or deployed in that spectrum. So it's a complex uh, economics, mathematics, science that is involved in deciding an auction and it's just not uh, uh, random calculations that happen for deciding the spectrum price and the auction strategies, etc. So uh, with respect to that, I will talk about uh, what we have been doing with respect to standards and why standards are important uh, uh, to be uh, taken care of. Uh, and at the end, I will uh, talk about what, with respect to uh, R&D, what we are doing at uh, YSIG, the startup I'm uh, uh, involved with, and IIT Hyderabad, uh, where I am uh, a faculty. Uh, finally, what we should do next and what's happening next in India, I can uh, talk about it. So currently, uh, uh, so there's a, uh, with all the change in geopolitics, uh, uh, there's a huge interest, uh, especially nationwide, uh, uh, with respect to uh, enhancing India's uh, uh, skills across uh, technology, wireless communication, cyber security, IoT. I mean, all of these are critically tied to the national interest and uh, they're also tied up with national security. Uh, so for instance, if an operator deploys a network, and the equipments are uh, not within our control. I mean, uh, someone may actually bring it down. Like I mean, you may be reading news about how power grids can be brought down by uh, malicious entities. The same thing may happen to a telecom infrastructure and uh, think about when a calamity happens, uh, how, how would you handle uh, uh, just a second. Hmm. Yeah, uh, so it, it is, it's quite crucial that uh, we have control over the infrastructure that is deployed. Uh, not, not necessarily control, but you need to know what is going on uh, in the equipment and the infrastructure that is deployed within our country. With, re with respect to this, I mean, the government has uh, um, uh, suggested that uh, ind indigenous R&D capabilities, and not just R&D capabilities, uh, there should be uh, a focus on domestic manufacturing uh, and develop in India, but uh, make for the world. Make in India, but make for the world. Uh, deploy for the world. So that, that is a strategy that uh, government is following nowadays. Uh, I mean, uh, don't just go blindly by some random news articles, but there's a lot that goes behind the scenes and things have changed significantly in the last few years. Uh, and there's a huge thrust on IP, IPR creation to make India an IP uh, clubhouse. Uh, with respect to this also, I will share you some news articles that IIT Hyderabad and YSIG have uh, published recently. And uh, and the, there's also a thrust about influencing standards, standards bodies. So, so this will become clear in the next few slides so that these standards become very important because if you do not project India's interest, it will always be developed by the Western world for the Western countries. Uh, but uh, like I will show you and discuss in the next few slides, uh, what is developed for the Western world may not necessarily work for the Indian uh, settings. So if you do not participate, if you do not uh, uh, argue, or if you not argue, if you do not put forth your ideas with the international community, they will not understand that what we see is different from what they see. So what is really unique about uh, India's mobile telephony? Uh, so, uh, so it has been changing in the last few, uh, last few years, and this is from a tri-report from early this year. 
the number of wired internet subscribers is 22 million but the wireless subscribers in india has shot up to 700 million the number here total wireless subscriber shows a different number but probably it is because of uh, multiple connections with uh, a single person and 80 percent of the traffic is being generated by mobile phones in india nowadays uh, especially after the pandemic i mean most of uh, people working from home or even attending classes uh, you use our uh, 4g connection to be able to do this so so the, the, the traffic generated by mobile phones has significantly shot up. And we are one of the highest consumers of data in the world. I mean, a TRI report says 11 GB, but there's an Ericsson report which says that uh, we use 14 GB of data per month on an average, which is quite huge compared to the rest of the world. And uh, what is uh, remarkably mind blowing is that uh, uh, the price per GB of wireless data is the cheapest in India across the world. We pay the least amount of phone bills for getting 4G connections across the world. I mean, no, no price, and I mean, no surprises and no prizes for guessing why this has happened. All this changed from 2017. Uh, the market play, uh, space uh, blowed up and uh, remarkable things have happened in the last few years. And I don't think India would have been pandemic ready if not for the reforms that were done in 2017. So currently, it's still India relies on 4G spectrum, uh, 4G LTE. Uh, uh, right now, 5G spectrum is being talked about and there are talks that uh, spectrum will be auctioned uh, in early part of 2022. Uh, but uh, uh, keep in mind that trials have already started. So government has already given trial spectrum for Airtel, Geo, uh, BSNL, Vodafone and uh, each of them with their own partners are doing several 5G trials across the country. So 5G is already being understood how it works in India from the last few months. Yeah, this is an Ericsson report that I was mentioning about. So if you see here, uh, the numbers could be slightly different. It just depends on who is doing the survey. Uh, huge, I mean, compared to, and this, what it shows here is in 2020, 4G is leading uh, the connection uh, technology. 4G is a leading connection technology in India. Uh, 3G is there. Uh, there's still a lot of 2G present in India. But uh, in few years, for four or five years, uh, you will almost see 2G going away, 4G 60% and a big part of 5G will be there. And a lot of countries are already talking about uh, removing their uh, 2G networks. I mean, uh, now if you, there are technologies to support voice over LTE, most of you may already be using that feature in one of the carriers. Um, if you have one of the uh, network operator SIM cards, you will, there's no 2G support in that network. It was a greenfield deployment. They did not even, Consider uh, talking about uh, age-old technology. I mean, 2G was 2000, uh, I mean, 1990s technology, right? I mean, the, that operator has taken a very, very bold decision to not uh, go with uh, uh, slightly old technology and they have rammed up supremely well. And I think the number of complaints about this uh, uh, operator have also reduced significantly. What else is happening in this uh, technology space is uh, there's a huge uh, uh, push for IoT. So a lot of Indian operators are launching uh, nationwide narrowband IoT services. So IoT is uh, uh, you want to connect every device in the house or every uh, like a lamp post and a traffic light everywhere. You want to deploy IoT devices to be able to control them, save energy, save water. Uh, for agri-tech, you want to use it. Uh, for cyber security, for like uh, uh, security cameras, you want to use IoT sensors and IoT chips so that you get uh, device real-time data that is transmitted from these devices and collect them in a cloud center. Yeah, this is an example that uh, one of the operators is trying to 20,000 crore opportunity. So one application that I've been told is they want to uh, deploy uh, a million of uh, these chipsets as uh, child tracking devices. I mean, I'm not uh, not sure about you, but uh, I would love to get a hold of that uh, device. I mean, it's, I think it will be, they want to sell it for something like less than a hundred rupees uh, device. 
So with respect to IoT, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot new of applications, cloud computing, blockchain, everything. And uh, eventually this is where the market is going. So I was just reading an article uh, a little while ago that NB IoT market is just catching up in the rest of the world as well. And India is also doing it almost uh, at the same time as the rest of the world. So with this uh, background about uh, what's happening in India, 4G, 5G, and uh, what's going on, I want to introduce you about what is so specific about uh, India. So the Indian rural setting is quite contrasting to any other rural setting in the world. So and the, in the recent times, I mean, for the first time, rural users, uh, I mean, again, as a slightly different number from a different uh, survey, uh, but anyways, uh, the, uh, but the general notion is that the number of rural subscribers have significantly increased compared to urban subscribers. And significant investments will be made to boost rural coverage. I mean, most of them are starting to work from home, right? Uh, so, so rural settings are quite important. Uh, but uh, so a, a typical rural setting looks like this in India. So there's a gram panchayat, uh, and there are several villages that come under the gram panchayat. Uh, so the government of India's vision, and which is already being uh, executed from the last five six years, is that every gram panchayat will be deployed with a backhaul. So there's an optical network, there's an optical cable that will be connected to this gram panchayat. And at that gram panchayat, there will be a, either a Wi-Fi access point or a cellular access point. And each of the villages which are around the gram panchayat will be connected to this uh, network tower. But the, uh, while deploying this network tower itself is a, a challenge, but uh, the, the connecting the optical cable to the gram panchayat is an even bigger challenge. Think about all the hilly regions that we have and northeast, uh, northeastern regions, etc., where not many uh, deployments are there. Apparently, uh, uh, even in uh, uh, the remotest of the remotest areas in Sikkim, uh, Geo has their optical cables laid already. So it takes guts to do something like that. And once you have this optical cable, I think you can always uh, get this deployment done. So this is the optical cable uh, project that the government has taken up. This is called BharatNet. Uh, so right now the cost of the project is somewhere around 50,000 crores. So they want to reach uh, fiber uh, to two and a half lakh gram panchayats in India. So far they have laid uh, four lakh kilometers of optical cable. And I, this may be a month old. This number keeps updating every day. You can check this website. Uh, now I think 1, 1. 1.7 lakh gram panchayats out of 2.5 lakh are uh, already connected and uh, some more will be connected. And uh, those gram panchayats, you can see that uh, there are Wi-Fi access points installed in these gram panchayats. But Wi-Fi is an interim solution, but 5G will be used to address the last mile connectivity between the Gram Panchayat and the uh, neighboring villages. So one study that my colleague from IIT Madras has done is uh, the following. Uh, so what is the distance between uh, uh, Gram Panchayat and the neighboring villages? So this was a study that was done in uh, uh, using some data that is available from the government. What they have found out is uh, from the Gram Panchayat, a radius of three kilometers only covers 60% of the villages that come under the Gram Panchayat. And, but a radius of six kilometers covers 95% of the villages uh, of that uh, Gram Panchayat. I'll tell you why this becomes important. But uh, So for instance, if there's a Gram Panchayat here, uh, within a six kilometer radius, you will cover all the 95% of the villages that uh, are under the control of that Gram Panchayat. So now, uh, uh, so until 2016, 2017, 2018, um, some, uh, so there are standard bodies called as ITU and 3GPP, International Telecommunications Union, which is a United Nations driven body. This is run by countries and this is called 3GPP, which is driven by companies. So these are the two standard bodies that were designing cellular standards for the world. Yeah, for the world, yes. North America, Europe, Asia, everywhere, even India. So uh, until before 5G, actually uh, even 4G, what India did was it just uh, adopted what was developed by these uh, standard bodies. It did not really do anything much. Uh, uh, other, uh, it was mostly a, um, a silent participant of uh, these organizations, but did not contribute heavily to these uh, uh, studies. 
so one contrasting thing that we, uh, uh, we identified was that in these standard bodies, uh, the design is done under certain uh, assumptions. So for rural settings, uh, they take the following into consideration. Um, so, okay, there, there's this uh, term called intersite distance. Maybe let me go back and show you what it means. So if uh, people familiar with cellular technologies, they will know that uh, hexagonal topologies are uh, tra traditionally used to deploy cellular tech, uh, uh, wireless networks. So essentially at the middle of the hexagon, there will be a wireless access point. And this is because you can tile the entire region uh, without any gaps. Now, I told you that there's, there's a radius of six kilometers. There's, there's a specific relationship between radius and ISD. So, uh, so for uh, so ra if radius is six kilometers, the intersite distance intersite distance means the distance between two access points or two cell phone towers. And that's square root of three times this radius. So, so if the radius is six kilometer, the intersite distance that uh, distance between two towers is ten kilometers. Now. These standard bodies did studies and developed standards for an intersite distance of 1.7 kilometers. And uh, first thing, uh, remember in the previous slide, I'm talking about we need 10 kilometers of intersite distance to be able to cover 95% of the villages. But these studies see that they only talk about 1.7 kilometer intersite distance. And you also should look at the speeds of interest. They designed the standard assuming 500 kilometer per hour uh, mobility the speed of 500 kmph. Where in India, in which village do, do vehicles move at 500 kmph? Uh, I mean, even 120 kmph is a rare speed in our rural settings. I mean, these speeds make sense for bullet trains and uh, the highways that are found in the Western world. Definitely in those rural settings, I mean, last vast pieces of land, I mean, there are highways where people zoom past at 120 km per hour. But this is not the case for India. I mean, we hardly have uh, good roads to go at a decent speed. And uh, the distribution of the users will also be quite different. So what happened was uh, until 5G studies, uh, these organizations did not have a rural use case that suited the rural deployments or rural needs of developing countries. So what happened? Uh, so for instance, uh, you all know about wireless channel propagation, right? Uh, so the wireless channel propagation in rural uh, India may be more, very different from what you see in rural US. So if you do not take into consideration the propagation conditions of uh, rural India, I mean, the standard may not even work. You'll have to live with what they have developed, but then the cost of deploying such a network that was developed for the Western world may be quite high for India. And then that could be not so attractive for operators. That's why you see that uh, the rural deployments are not done as fast. Right, so these are the two points I want to highlight. Yeah, so rural connectivity and its opportunities. This is an uh, article from uh, Ericsson. Uh, what they say directly is, in other words, the business case is rather weak to deploy in rural areas. I mean, that is precisely why the costs and all you can see here, urban settings, rural settings, and remote areas are like the remote villages, which are in a hilly areas or in a valley where the access is very limited. So the business case is rather weak. So, uh, so, so for instance, if you have to develop a deploy a network every 1.7 kilometer in such areas, the cost of the capital expenditure, operational expenditure of such a network will be huge. But then if you design a system such that uh, if you deploy an access point at this uh, hexagon at the Gram Panchayat, but it can cover a lot more villages, you reduce one tenth of the cost, maybe then the business case will become more attractive. So that is what we have been trying to push across different organizations. The first organization that we have been trying to focus on is called 3GPP. It's called Third Generation Partnership Project. So this is a standards body. Uh, so it had a different name initially, 3GPP2, which developed CDMA. Uh, 3GPP developed uh, 2G, but then both these organizations merged together and they developed 3G, 4G, and now 5G. So what we have done is we have participated we have, for the first time uh, from 2016, we participated uh, in these uh, standard organizations uh, from IIT Hyderabad side with our partners from these organizations. We contributed several, several uh, ideas uh, about how 5G should be. And we told them that for India, this is how it should, the design should look like. 
uh, guys forget what you are doing for us you should also consider indian rural settings so that is what we have uh, uh, propagated in these uh, standard organizations we uh, for the first time I mean, professor kiran i mean uh, he's one of the leading forces behind these efforts from indian side so he has been doing research on this from 2009 2010 and finally in 2015 we started pushing these ideas uh, into standard organizations so so the research starts almost 5 6 years before the standards and then you take these research ideas into the standards and you convince uh, all the companies across the world some 300 400 companies delegates uh, all 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 bright minds from across the world come here we have to fight with them argue them tell them hey no this is how it works this is what's happening and we have to convince them that this is all these are all the benefits that you get from such a design and this is really needed for india and we are still continuing to do that uh, across the different releases of 5g so the standard evolves with different different features and we are even today i uh, i represent iit hyderabad at these organizations and we uh, promote india's interest yeah this is a picture uh, we are also somewhere in this picture uh, uh, this was where uh, it was declared that 5g is ready in uh, june 2018 uh june 2018 when uh, uh, so many people and many more uh, across the world uh, they came together designed 5g for two and uh, for one and a half two years brainstormed this is this was from a standards perspective not from a research perspective research uh, every organization does its own research much ahead of time they come here argue and uh, there's almost 1200 1300 people attend such meetings uh, ericsson qualcomm nokia uh, all the big wigs are there yeah and india uh, all our indian delegates are also somewhere in this uh, picture so what uh, one of our uh, breakthrough efforts is to uh, creating a new waveform uh, called pi by 2 bpsk waveform uh, this waveform what it does is uh, it increases the uplink power so our mobile phones right uh, whenever you are in a rural coverage uh, you may see that uh, depending on where the tower is uh, Uh, you are trying to camp to the base station you are trying to connect to the cell phone tower if you do not have enough power on this uh, mobile phone you cannot your signal cannot reach the tower and that's why you will see connection losses uh, what we are saying is in the remotest of the remotest areas uh, our design can actually work and uh, with uh, uh, with our innovative research designs you can increase the uplink transmission power by 6 db uh, think about it 6 db means uh, 3 db is doubling the power 6 db is four times the power so without draining much of the battery without do, sucking much of the battery what we have showed is that uh, you can increase the ue transmission power uh, without a significant uh, increase in bat uh, so so we say we show that there will there will be an increase in the battery life due to our designs and we increase the coverage uh, so even rural areas can be achieved 100% coverage can be achieved by using these waveforms so the, actually the world was stunned when india proposed these ideas because uh, never before uh, someone from india have proposed such ideas in standard uh, organizations in the international bodies and and 2g 3g 4g waveforms never i mean it is once in a lifetime that waveforms get introduced into a standard and this is this just shook india and different people in india and international bodies that india was capable of doing such things I mean, these are some technical details so uh, i'll quickly go through it so we take a bpsk signal we do some rotation 90 degree rotation we do some uh, filtering on the waveform and then pass it to a traditional uh, dfts or pm receiver so it has its own benefits we have written several papers uh, you can check them online so these are some recent uh, so these ideas uh, we of course have to make sure that we patent them we protect them with patents so um, these are some new, uh, recent press releases that we released so we have disclosed some 25 patents to the world we have almost 110 patents uh, at uh, wiseg and uh, iit hyderabad out of this 25 we have uh, 25 are agreed so far we have disclosed them publicly saying that uh, uh, these are the patents that are there in 5g so we have something if you see here the blue one here we say that there are some standard essential patents so what it what standard essential means that without our patent without our ideas 5g will not work so anyone who wants to use 5g will have to use our ideas and that way they'll have to pay royalties to india so yeah this is shaking up uh, the tech scene in the uh, in these industry bodies right now so there is another organization called itu which is a united nations organization that we have been part of um, 
uh, we had to be part, I'll explain why we had to be part of this. So ITU is a United Nations telecom body. What they do is they define how a technology should be, 3G, 4G, 5G. So these are the people who say that this is actually driven by countries, not companies, but countries. So India is a delegate. United States is a delegate. Korea is a delegate. North Korea, is, I don't know North Korea, but I've seen South Korea, China, uh, Russia. These are all delegates of this uh, organization. You know, right? UN is run by countries. Uh, so uh, the, this organization makes sure that spectrum is harmonized across all the countries. And they also make sure that they define what a new generation of technology should look like. So for with respect to 5G, these, uh, uh, this organization uh, came up with a, a blueprint which says that uh, three or four documents will be there. These are called IMT 2020 documents. They tell that if anyone, for us to say that a technology is 5G, for us means for this body to say that a technology is 5G, it needs to achieve uh, a particular amount of throughput, like one Gbps. It should achieve some amount of latency, like one millisecond latency. It should connect million devices in one square kilometer of region. So they, they put forth some ideas like this. So once this body puts up uh, guidelines like this, uh, other standard bodies like uh, 3GPP, they take up these requirements and create a technology that meets these requirements. So anyone who knows about 4G, uh, back in 2006 and uh, time frame, there were two technologies that were competing for 4G uh, uh, reputation. One is LTE, the other is something called as WiMAX. It is a brother of Wi-Fi. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both, both were uh, approved as 4G technologies by this organization. But anyways, due to market concerns, uh, uh, WiMAX died down and only 4G LT survived. Uh, something similar is happening for 5G. So last year, uh, there were, I mean, uh, we have been attending this meeting from 2017. And last year, something significant happened, which I will show you in the next slide. Um, and now, now that 5G is almost uh, stamped, uh, this organization has already started the directions for 6G. So there are reports called IMT 2030 reports that are being made, which are defining what 6G should look like. Should it have artificial intelligence? Should it have machine learning? Should it have UAVs? All kinds of new technologies are being talked about. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there's another standard body which I should mention you, which is part of India, which is called TSDSI, which is India's Telecom Standards Development Organization. So uh, let me go back. So ITU is a global body run by countries. They take, they define the requirements, and then this global body called 3GPP, which is driven by companies and something called as seven SDOs, uh, uh, standard development organizations. Uh, the seven organizations are like this. Uh, uh, ATS in USA, Arab in Japan, uh, TTIC in Japan, China, Europe, India, and Korea. So we are some organizational partners. So within India, there is an organization which drives standards in India. It's called TSDSI. Uh, so whenever we participate on behalf of India, we first have to participate here, then we participate here, and then we participate here. You have to do it at multiple levels. You have to convince people at multiple levels. You have to uh, make sure you get the support uh, at different, different levels. So in ITU, there were two main tracks that we took up. Uh, one is LMLC, it's called Low Mobility Large Cell, and the other is a, a technology, uh, indigenous 5G technology. So I'll explain both of those. And these efforts are pre, uh, mainly driven by Professor Radha Krishna Ganti from IIT Madras. I think you remember this slide. Uh, what is the Indian topology that we are interested in? Uh, like again, remember this number that we want uh, uh, for a radius of six kilometers covers 95% of the villages. And a radius of six kilometer means there's a tower around it. There's a radius of six kilometer. I can cover 95% uh, of the villages. But from one tower to another tower, the distance will be 10 kilometers. So what we did was, uh, if you remember uh, uh, the table that I showed you a few slides ago, it said that standard organizations uh, were only considering uh, the distance between two towers is 1.7 kilometers. But what we were successful in convincing the world at ITU, which is the UN body, is that you should introduce a configuration and requirements that any technology that is called as 5G will have to do something like this. It should achieve coverage. See, for instance, if I design a technology for 1.7 kilometer in mind, it means that 
that technology will not work beyond 1.7 kilometers. I mean, one point, it's not like it won't work, but it will, uh, they won't consider that this technology should support a user which is 10 kilometers away or 6 kilometers away or 12 kilometers away. Uh, so that guy is ignored. So, but we said we fought across and said that now you have to design a technology. So 5G as a technology should satisfy India's rural constraints. By doing after uh, several fights, uh, what we managed was, it was a give and take, it was a compromise agreement. We finally said that uh, the 5G technology, a uh, technology will be called as 5G only if it uh, has an uh, inter-site distance of six kilometers. So it is definitely not 10.3, but it is six kilometers. So it was, it was a, lo a lot of debates that happened at international scenarios with a lot of government of India support. Finally, it was a compromise agreement. Instead of 1.7, we at least managed to get six kilometers. So anyone who says they are doing a 5G technology, they first have to prove that uh, such a setting, this setting. Uh, so if they deploy a cell phone tower, they should show that in India's rural settings, so they can cover 70 to 80% of the Indian villages. Otherwise, it will not be called as 5G. Right, so uh, as part of that efforts, what we managed to introduce was a test requirement. It says that 5G should work in such a uh, deployment scenario with six kilometer inter-site distance and so and so power, so and so band, etc. So, and uh, ITU, the, it, it comes up with a table where uh, there will be test cases. Uh, EMBB means uh, enhanced mobile broadband. What they say is uh, in a particular rural setting, in the downlink, you have to achieve 3.3 Mbps uh, spectral efficiency, bits per second per uh, transmission receive points, spectral efficiency. If you achieve, then yes, we will take a yes that you achieve this uh, test setting. If you do not, we will take a no. If there is a no, it means it will not be a 5G technology. So that way we put pressure on the international community that you have to design something for India. See, uh, whatever you design for US and Europe may not work in India. Uh, but uh, with respect to 4G, we had to do that. With 4G, what happened was we had to live with, India had to live with what was designed for the rest of the world. And that's why the cost of deployment of 4G is higher. In India also, and it took more time for India to de uh, deploy uh, 4G. Uh, but we said, no, uh, nothing taking, and you have to do it uh, for Indian requirements also. So only when there is a yes here, uh, we will stamp it as a 5G technology. So this uh, put pressure on the international community that, uh, okay, we have to take care of India's requirements. Okay, let us design the technology in a particular way. Yeah, like this, there will be several test cases, indoor cases, uh, dense urban means uh, like Bombay or Delhi kind of a setting. Rural cases means uh, uh, our rural village settings, it has to work. And these are some specific use cases that have to be, all these test cases have to be satisfied by the technology before it's called 5G. So this is a five, six year long effort. We have been uh, going to several international meetings. Uh, uh, I mean, several lots of simulations, lots of implementations, lots of background work goes on in this technology. And that's why I'm saying that India has been doing 5G from a research side from 2009, 2010, from an international side, 2016, just like the rest of the world, we have also been doing 5G from, uh, from a very, very, very long time. So what we did was, uh, despite all these efforts, uh, there were some compromises that we had to make in uh, 3GPP technology. So what uh, India decided was, uh, no, 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 no going back. Uh, let us design an India's own 5G standard. So what we did was we created an India's own 5G standard. And I don't know if any of you know about this. We have an India's own 5G standard. It is called uh, uh, 5GI, 5G India or 5G Improved. Uh, so this is only the second technology. So 3GPP, uh, there is one technology called 5G from this organization called 3GPP. And then there's a second technology called 5GI, which is from India. These are the only two globally approved 5G technologies in the world right now. And you should be proud that India has done something like this. At least I am very proud. I'm part of this brilliant team, which uh, did this. Yeah, you can see here, it's called 5G India or 5G Improved, however you want to read it, we called it as 5G I. Uh, and there's a lot of debate in India if uh, which uh, technology will be used by Airtel, BSNL, Vodafone and Vio, 5G or 5G I. So it's already in the press, so if you type 5G I, uh, <laughs> I, I was surprised to see that people are talking even in you making YouTube videos about this. So there's a lot of talk about India's own 5G standard. 
so that is the story of standard so uh, the summary is that india when i say india indian academia some indian industries and indian government we all have been collectively participating at global meetings pushing india's agenda we created an india's own 5g standard and purely indigenous 5g standard uh, that is uh, approved by international organizations saying that yes it meets all the criteria for uh, uh, saying for, for uh, calling itself a 5g technology so uh, yeah so this comes from a standards perspective now let me touch upon the r and d efforts that happen so there's a 250 crore project that was uh, approved by government of india uh it was even announced in the parliament by shri arun jaitley back then uh that uh, government of india is uh, propelling uh, india's interest they want to build india's indigenous capabilities in this upcoming technologies and they sanctioned a 250 crore project across these institutions that you see here iit hyderabad is one of them we got a big share of this uh and uh, we have been developing uh, this got approved in feb 2018 the project will end in december 2021 uh, we are at the final stages of the project where we are showing a fully indigenous fully indian developed uh, 5g products the software is developed in india the hardware is developed in india uh who would have thought india is capable of doing all of this so yeah if you can see i mean it says march but due to pandemic it got extended to a few days because we all have to we were forced to work from offline so the timelines were slightly shifted by 6 months so but we are we, are, we will be showing demos of uh, india's 5g technology uh, pretty soon so we developed uh, this is from iit madras so uh, millimeter wave uh, equipment massive mimo equipment we uh, iit hyderabad has designed an iot chipset we have developed an iit hyderabad has developed an indigenous 5g software the entire software is written by uh, iit hyderabad uh, we are building this network which has all these components and several demos are there at iit hyderabad we have several third party equipment industry grade equipment we have done several demos at right? massive mimo at uh, trade shows in uh, mobile world congress in uh, uh, los angeles we have done it in uh, mobile world congress in spain barcelona we have done it and we have also done in india mobile congress we have shown our capabilities to the world uh, so so we have finished standards we have finished r and d so what next i think the question is spectrum right so spectrum is already allocated uh, i mean spectrum and deployments so spectrum is already allocated 5g trials have already started airtel jio are already doing uh, 5g trials in different areas so yesterday there was a news article saying airtel and ericsson are doing 5g trials in rural india and they achieved some 200 mbps of speed in some village in uh, outskirts of delhi uh, so 5G is already here. 5G is around you. It will be around you before you know. I mean, there are already. Uh, yeah, Geo begins. Uh, Geo is making their own 5G equipment. Right. So, uh, so full-fledged 5G. I think maybe, uh, maybe one year down the line, we will also start using 5G in India in uh, small bits and pieces. But then, in a couple of years, two, three years down the line, most of us will be switching to 5G. uh so at least in the case of 4g india was uh, several years late uh, 3g we were eternally late 4g we were slightly late maybe 7 years uh, later than the rest of the world but 5g uh, it has come down to only a couple of years uh, there are several other things that have to be taken care of so we cannot call it as late but there are several geo things that we have to take care of geo as in geopolitics uh, several other things that run around um and so with 5g maybe we are just a couple of years late and with 6g no we are not going to stay stay back there are already 6g uh, forum 6g organization 6g tech talks that are happening in india from the government side from tsdsi side there are industry bodies uh, that are coming together to design uh, 6g and what 6g should be for india and we are taking this to global bodies again uh, 6g research has already started in india we are just on par with the rest of the world we are not lagging behind uh, at all yes yeah, so with that i'll end my talk i'm happy to answer any questions hello sir thank you for such an interesting uh, journey of 5g in india and really i must 
uh, admit that uh, quite a few of us were not aware that India has been able to make a mark in global standards as you have just uh, let us know. And I'm sure there are quite a few questions uh, which the audience would like to ask. So I would now uh, request our volunteers, Ashutosh and Belton, to take up the questions, please. Uh, yeah, sure. So we have a question. Uh, so deployment of 5G in rural areas uh, has its challenges. Uh, there are even places uh, that have not received 4G properly yet in India. So deployment of 5G in such regions will pose a problem. So what kind of uh, business challenges do you foresee and problems that we, we will face in the future? So 5G and 4G are not linked. I mean, I mean, uh, there, there are a case, <clears throat> there is one kind of a deployment where 5G uh, doesn't need 4G at all. So, I mean, you don't have to link 5G and 4G. Uh, someone who wants to do a greenfield deployment, for instance, people were thinking, uh, uh, let me tell you the scenario for 4G. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so when Geo was actually, uh, Reliance Geo was uh, trying to deploy a 4G network, people advised Geo against going with only a 4G network. But Geo being Geo, they said, no, I will not go with a old stalemate technology like 2G. See, uh, why, why was 2G needed in India uh, at least three, four years ago? Because a lot of uh, calls were being made, right? India was still a voice prominent uh, uh, country, uh, the most of the exchanges that happen over cellular is still voice calls. Uh, they did not perceive India as a data oriented country. But then Reliance Geo did this great gamble where they said, no, I will not uh, pay, pay billions of dollars on uh, deploying a technology where it will die out uh, sooner rather than later. So what they did was they went and deployed 4G, but they, they ensured that there's a technology where voice can still be carried over 4G. So voice actually looks like data, but then behind in the packet core network, it gets converted into voice and all that. It's all handled. If it's possible for 4G, it's definitely possible for 5G, and 5G is not linked to 4G at all. So you don't have to worry that where there's no 4G, 5G will not come. Absolutely not. You don't please don't have such worries. Thank you, sir. Hi, sir. Yes, please. Uh, could you speak a little louder? Somehow I'm hearing it very low. Yeah. Um. I'm quite audible now. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so as you were saying, there is quite a lot of network traffic nowadays due to pandemic because people are working online. So can 5G solve the problems of network traffic? Yeah. So we are hoping that, yes, the technology was developed to address uh, such a thing and not just uh, enhance throughput. I mean, uh, for us, from a, a use case perspective, there will be two differences that uh, I personally think we will see with respect when we switch to 5G. One is I will have a better download speed uh, because 5G, fundamentally, the technology is developed to handle much larger bandwidths than uh, 4G. So 4G was designed to handle 20 megahertz of one carrier, but 5G is designed to handle 100 megahertz of spectrum. So fundamentally, the technology was designed to handle much larger bandwidth. So when the bandwidth is larger, you get uh, more amount uh, of uh, spectrum for, per user and you get more data rates. Not just that, the technology is also designed to handle millions of devices. Fundamentally, the way we design the technology is such that even if there are millions of devices, the technology won't break down. There won't be as many call drops. Uh, yes. So in that perspective, uh, uh, the, the experts who designed 5G made sure that it is possible. Yes. And, but that is what the trials uh, will eventually reveal. Okay. Uh, in India, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how much of these results will be made public, but that is the goal of trials in any country. Why, why do you think so? Some people may question if 5G is already, there, there's still uh, news articles last year, you will see. Uh, there are some companies which say that, no, no, we have already shown 5G works outside the world. It will work in India, just take it home. You know, you never know. I mean, uh, Indian settings are much different. So government uh, said, no, no, you have to show it. And you have to show, also develop India's 5G use cases. There, so there's a separate track being taken by India where uh, if there are any specific 5G use cases that we can solve. So for instance, uh, telehealth, uh, you want to do some robotic surgeries over uh, such technology. Is it possible? Uh, is it even remotely possible in Indian setting? So these things they will try out and all and finally conclude if these things are possible in India. But yes, uh, the fundamentally the technology is designed to do something better than 4G. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir, uh, how do you think the job market will progress as the 
number of projects in 5G in India? <laughs> uh, one thing I can sh- say right now is uh, since I'm associated with a startup and I also uh, look for uh, great talent. Uh, so I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, if any of you are interested in doing any good work, please uh, reach out to me. But yes, uh, so the, uh, the, the way, see, at first thing I will talk about academia. The, the, the awareness in academia and in Indian academia after we have done all these things in standards and that there is a huge recognition within India when academia does all of this. Uh, firstly, the academia has risen up. Indian academia said that, yes, we will also, we are capable of doing it and we will also do it. And uh, we are not behind the rest of the world. So that is one thing. There's a nice nice awakening that has happened in Indian academia. Then with respect to job market, oh yes, there's just tons and tons of companies that are coming up in India. Um, uh, there's this huge Make in India p- program that's going on, right? I mean, not many of you may know the reality, but uh, uh, there's lots being done. Uh, there's a lot of new jobs that are created. For instance, we we created almost 250 jobs uh, with our uh, 5G project. So we have trained almost 250 engineers uh, uh, in the last uh, three years from IIT Hyderabad side on 5G technology. And we are now going to train another 300, 400 people with our 5G advanced uh, technology. And we are also doing a 6G technology uh, proposal. We are already starting to work on 6G. We'll be training some other 400, 500 people in that. So yes, the government is actually creating a lot of jobs and industry, there are a lot of jobs in 5G. The market is super hot right now. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, sir. Sure. So the proposed 5G I standard, interoperable with 5G. So what changes would be needed in the user's equipment if it's launched? <laughs> Did you pick up this question from internet? <laughs> because not many people. Uh, this is a debate that we are having with the uh, international bodies. Uh, it is uh, purely interoperable and uh, you will see one of my talks. If you Google it, I have given a talk a couple of weeks ago in an IEEE Bangalore Society. Uh, where we said that uh, we have, uh, I have explicitly detailed what are the implementation challenges at a user equipment side and a base station side. Uh, uh, and I've also told, uh, the, uh, I mean, there are several people who have talked about the interoperability. I mean, it will work, yeah. Sir, uh, can you share any information on uh, opportunities for undergraduate engineering students uh, who are interested in working in research in uh, IG? Uh, could you say that again? Who, who are interested in research on 5G? 5G. What, what should I say? Sorry? Like any uh, opportunities or any uh, map or how, how they should go about it if they want to do a research in 5G? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, you, I would suggest you you can check our website 5G test by IIT Hyderabad. Uh, you can check our WISIG website. I mean, uh, we are developing uh, 5G products. Uh, we are developing, there's a huge amount of research that goes into massive MIMO technology for 5G, beam forming for 5G. Um, I mean, the, the, you proving it on real hardware, proving it in a real deployment scenarios, like an outdoor setting, like in a setting like Delhi. Massive MIMO has been there for some time. And the papers, theoretical papers were written from a long time. But proving it in uh, deployments, uh, real deployments is still a challenge. So. And then there's a huge focus about machine learning applications for 5G, 6G. The machine learning, I, I, I mean, you can check my website. There are several papers that I've written. There's some uh, uh, article magazine papers that I've written on how machine learning can enhance 5G and 6G. So, uh, I mean, one of my uh, research magazine, recent magazine papers uh, gives out a lot of problems that you can solve uh, in these areas. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, so as you were saying, for to develop a certain standard like for 5G, the the research starts like five, six years before. So f- in case we think about 6G, has the research begun yet? Oh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, even a couple of years before, I mean, it, uh, things have started much ahead of time. In India, we have started it last year. I mean, research has been going on, but formal collaborations in Indian uh, setting, we have started last year. Uh, the TSDSI is an organization where uh, we are coming together to formalize our 6G collaborations. But 6G research has already started in India. 
So is there an I mean, estimated? It's, it's very dicey. What what do you call six G? Anything that's not there in five G, you can call it a six G, right? You never know what six G will eventually be. But anything which is not there in five G, you work on it, and you can call it as six G. But generally, whatever the rest of the world is calling as six G, like reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or extreme massive MIMO. UAV networks, satellite networks, uh, cellular over satellite, uh, satellite IoT, machine learning. Uh, name these topics and India Academia. Uh, I don't know much about Indian industry working on 6G, but at least Indian Academia, I can say IT Hyderabad. We are already running several 6G programs. Sir, any uh, bad side effects on human bodies or animals and environment due to 5G <laughs> high frequency? Uh, I personally do not really. I am not an expert in that area. I, uh, <laughs> I cannot comment on that. But uh, what I can say is, there will always be regulations, just like any other technology. Uh, so it could be low frequency, high frequency, as long as there are regulations saying that you cannot transmit beyond a certain power level. Those regulations will be done, taking care of uh, something called as SAR limits, specific absorption rate SAR limits. The SAR limits will be such that, um, that they don't cause any harm to human body. So I'm sure the regulations will be taken care. That's all I can say. So a uh, last question: uh, Is there any plan to open 5G test bed for public areas? There is. There is a talk going on. Uh, again, it's an effort from TSDSI, Government of India, Department of Telecom, and uh, this uh, institutes that I showed the five six institutes. So there is uh, there uh, the exact mode of opening it up, how people can connect it remotely, or if they should come to the campus and connect it. All those modalities are being worked out, but most likely it should be available pretty soon. But yes. I mean, that is the eventual goal that the government wanted, that this test bed should be something that anyone can use. Not just uh, academia, but even Indian small industries, right? They may not have access to all the hardware that we do. Uh, so if someone wants to develop something, uh, the government envisioned that if the, such a uh, facility was there, is available in India, I mean, every common man can access it. But yes, the modalities are being worked out. Yes, sir. And in case if it's made public, uh, suppose a person has a 4G phone, then the results would be same or same as the like the 5G phone. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we don't, we haven't done 4G at all. Uh, so we have started purely with 5G. Uh, so uh, 5G phone. The goal is to ensure that a 5G, 5G capable phone will connect to this uh, network that we are designing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I now feel that it's time to recognize India's efforts towards 5G. And your talk has uh, definitely made us proud, as you said, as every Indian should be proud that India has made, has made its impact on the global scenario. And they have made the people realize that Indian terrain and Indian uh, rural areas should be taken care of while designing a particular network because we are the uh, probably one of the more uh, utilizing their uh, efforts towards 4G and 3G everywhere we were the uh, people who were using their uh, standards as they gave us. Yes. So I'm uh, sure that this talk has uh, made a deep impact on the students and hence we I had so. quite a good questions and yeah, they are so. yes. That's our goal. So we want to, we want more and more talent to come. I mean, you can check our websites. Uh, we are running several projects. We are looking for interns, uh, employees. I mean, we are looking for people around the clock. Uh, yeah. You can learn 5G, 6G. Come work with us. We'll teach yes, you things. Definitely. It means uh, uh, usually people have a mindset now that it, jobs are only in the IT sector and core sector is dying down. So with this talk of yours, I'm sure the students would be benefited and they would be uh, eager to learn more about 5G and uh, 6G. And we will definitely get in touch with you if uh, for internships or if students are interested in uh, working for this. And uh, I'm really happy on behalf of the department and the institute. I would like to uh, uh, appreciate your uh, time and effort taken for this talk. 
and uh, it would be nice if you could you could share these uh, slides or uh, presentation with us i'm sure the students and the staff would be benefited by this uh, yeah. session okay yeah. and uh, apart from this i would also like to uh, appreciate the efforts taken by the students and the participants and i'm uh, sure that they would have been greatly benefited by this talk uh, we will start with our next session uh, at 12.45. All the participants are requested to please fill up the feedback uh, form, which is put in the link in the Zoom chat. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir, so much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Saidi. Thanks, thanks ma'am. Yeah. yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks.
Good afternoon, Dr. Jasmine. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon. There. Good morning from my side. <laughs> Thank you for joining in. Thanks for accepting. You're welcome. Yes.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are moving forward to the next session that's on the topic RF design for ultra low power wireless communication in the next generation of 5G IoT devices. It's an honor and privilege to have with us Dr. Jasmine Grossenger, who is an expert in this domain. Before we start with the session, I would like to give a brief introduction about Professor Jasmine. Dr. Jasmine Grossinger holds a PhD degree from Vienna University of Technology, Vienna, Austria, since 2012. In January 2021, she received her Venia Docendi in RF and Microwave Engineering from Graz University of Technology, Austria. In her postdoctoral thesis, she examines the RF design for low ultra low power wireless communication systems. From 2008 to 2013, she was a project assistant with the Institute of Telecommunications, Vienna University of Technology. Professor Grossinger has authored about 60 peer reviewed publication and holds one US patent. She is actively involved in technical program and steering committees of various RF related conferences and is associate editor of the IEEE microwave and wireless components letters. She is a member of the IEEE microwave theory and technique society. And she is also the co-chair of the women in microwaves subcommittee of the member and geographic activities committee. On behalf of Don Bosco Institute of Technology and the department of electronics and telecommunication I request ma'am to kindly start the session. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will share my slides with you. So actually now you should be able to see the slides and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much for getting back to me. So thank you very much once again for the kind introduction and for inviting me to this symposium on 5G, the catalyst to digital revolution. You did see already the, or you heard already the title of my talk, which is RF design for ultra low power wireless communications in the next generation of 5G IoT devices. And, uh, why 5G IoT devices? So the fifth generation of mobile technologies is actually uh, trying to connect people, things, data, application, transport systems, and cities in smart networked communication networks. Here you can see actually one of these pictures, uh, what 5G will do and can do. It will enable en enhanced mobile broadband. It will enable ultra-reliable ultra and low latency communications, as well as massive machine type communications. And massive machine type communications, as you can see it here, it's kind of located in smart cities, smart homes, smart industry. And in there, typically you use uh, the so-called Internet of Things. So the 5G network will eventually be the backbone of the Internet of Things. And for Internet of Things, you need a lot of nodes, wireless nodes, which you distribute in your smart home, in your smart cities, in your smart production factories, for example. By this, we create actually a massive deployment of wireless IoT nodes. So we have to put a lot of nodes in there. And uh, it is actually um, projected that the number of connected devices on the internet will reach 50 billion anytime from 2025 onwards. So as you can see, this is a lot of devices and a lot of nodes that we're bringing out there. And of course, with this, sustainability issues arise on the environmental level also on the economic level and on the societal level. But in this talk, I really want to focus more on environmental level and economic level. And there are also um, 
a lot of people actually working towards reaching these sustainable development goals. And this kind of uh, trying to solve sustainability issues, which arise with IoT, which arise with 5G technologies, this is something that will be discussed in this talk. And I want to give some solutions, actually. I want to show you some radio frequency design solutions, which try to help solve these sustainability issues and which uh, go for or uh, will, will help us reach sustainability for our technologies. So in my research, typically, um, I try to translate these sustainability issues on environmental and economic level into these radio frequency design challenges. And uh, this I do, for example, by trying to get rid of batteries, of the ecotoxicity of batteries, and also of the cost of battery replacement. And we can do this actually by providing an ultra low power wireless communication. Ideally, having no batteries, for example, within the communication devices, in particular in the IoT nodes, the wireless IoT nodes. Another thing we, we can do to uh, solve these sustainability issues is try to uh, reach a high level of integration for our IoT nodes, which will minimize carbon footprint and also reduce the cost related to production and end of life. So, and uh, these challenges uh, we want to solve in our research. And uh, today I will show you actually how we, we can solve this for some specific design examples, and in particular for miniaturized ultra low power wireless IoT nodes, which are efficiently miniaturized, provide passively and provide passively sensing. And how we can reach this miniaturized ultra low power wireless sensor nodes is actually by going for this ultra low power wireless communication technology. And in particular, here in this talk, I will focus on a passive communication technology based on high frequency HF and ultra high frequency UHF radio frequency identification technologies, short RFID technologies. And uh, for reaching a high level of integration, here we propose to use system on a chip, SOC, and system in a package, SIP concept, based on, so on CMOS technologies, which are kind of, uh, which are a very cost effective choice of technology for, from the semiconductor specific uh, side. So CMOS uh, means complementary metal oxide semiconductors. And here, for example, you can see already some uh, devices that we realized together with industry partners, in particular, this one with uh, Infineon Technologies here in Austria. We were, we were working together to miniaturize RFID text to really have this miniaturized ultra low power wireless sensor nodes, which we can then put into the environment, into our homes, into our cities, and still be sustainable from this perspective. Now, first of all, before we go deeper into the different design solutions, I want to uh, um, talk a little bit about the specific technologies we are using here in this talk. It's the RFID technology, as I said before. So, um, and in particular, I want to emphasize what's the difference also between high frequency RFID and UHF RFID. For high frequency RFID technologies, um, and it's the same for UHF in this case, you have the wireless communication between reader and a battery, battery less passive tech. Tech means transponder. And you can see here such a system. You have the HF RFID reader, you have the, H, uh, the HF RFID tech, and the reader provides power and data towards the tech, and the tech communicates with the reader, typically its identification number. I will also show you some sensing data, which is included in this communication link by uh, load modulation for HF RFID systems. So the 
the tag is actually then re realizing kind of an, a reflection of the reader signal, so to say. And in, ca in the case of HF RFID technologies, we're focusing on inductive coupling. So the reader and the tag, both of them consists of coils, which are then inductively coupled. What I have to say here is that uh, the tag, as it is a battery-less device, does not have a, a real transmitter, but rather rather uses a, a load modulator to communicate its identification number to the reader. The operating frequency for HF RFID is at 13.56 megahertz and inductive coupling. Uh, because if you would think of using here uh, other communication, like electromagnetic radiation and reception, you definitely have a problem with antenna size. Uh, the vicinity uh, the standards that are typically used uh, for out there uh, for RFID, HF RFID, are the ISO IEC 15693 and uh, 18,003 standards which are the so-called vicinity standards where you get read ranges up to one meter. If you um, think of contactless payment, which we use all the time, you go for the proximity standard, which relies on the very famous 14443 ISO IEC standard and for near-field communication, the extension 18093 where you can find then all the, the, the NFC, that uh, techno uh, technology information that we actually use for contactless payment, et cetera. And here the read, read range is uh, smaller. It's up to 10 centimeters. Uh, maybe to, to clarify this, the read range is actually the communication range of the reader and how far we can uh, separate reader and tag to still have the communication there. Applications for HF RFID are typically access management and protection, inventory and supply chain management, point of sales terminals, loyalty, toys and board games. And there are many more and there will come many more. For UHF RFID technologies, you can already see on the figure that it's kind of different in communication range. Uh, on the top of this um, avial engine testbed, it's an industry partner we cooperate uh, very uh, vividly with. Uh, we have the antenna array with the UHF RFID reader, which then sends data and power towards the tag if enough power is available at the tag site, which is battery less. And the tag starts to communicate its identification number. And in this case, it the scatters the reader signal, and uh, it's called a scatter modulated signal. What the tech is using for the uh, for the communication towards the the, the, the reader. The operating frequency is higher. It's eight, between eight hundred and sixty and nine hundred and sixty megahertz. Here in Europe, typically we use the eight six eight megahertz. Uh, frequency for communication. In Japan, you use uh, 950 megahertz. The communication principle that we are using is electromagnetic wave propagation. So you really radiate and receive. So you need different kinds of antennas. They are typically dipole antennas on the tech side and um, catch antennas on the reader side. As you can imagine, you need a, uh, you only need a directional radiation on broadside radiation as provided by patch antennas. If you mount the reader on the walls or on the on the, the on the ceiling, and the tag, as you never know where the tag is located within your environment, you typically try to have an omnidirectional radiation pattern for the antenna. So you go towards uh, typically dipole antennas. Read range can be up to 10 meters, could also be longer. The standards that we are relying on is the 18006 standard and applications. Currently is automatic vehicle identification, package tagging, brand protection, inventory and supply management. 
and there are many more to come, hopefully. Now, if you if we think back, what are our goals in RF design for to solve the sustainability issues that arise with this massive deployment of IoT nodes? We definitely would read, try to reach a high integration for our, our IoT nodes. So we would like to miniaturize the nodes. And so we have to do this in an efficient way because communication must still be available. But uh, one thing is, um, if you take a look at the tag here on the right side, this is, this is a UHF RFID tag, which I got when I attended a conference back in 2009 when I was a PhD student in Bangkok. And uh, they already provided a tag with the conference badge, which was quite nice for me, though, because I was... Oh, already working on RFID technologies, you can see that you have this dipole kind of antenna and here the connections to the chip. The chip is here, uh, you cannot see it, it's kind of an inlay in the, in the substrate that we see here in the blue part. And we can see that actually from the tech perspective, which consists of antenna and chip, antenna is the largest part. And ideally to have an efficient communication and an efficient communication range and harvest enough power provided by the reader, we definitely would go for an efficient operation of that antenna. So for UHF and a dipole antenna, we, uh, we would definitely think of a dipole having the length of half the wavelength that we're operating it. So uh, saying the wavelength is 30 centimeter at UHF. We want to have a dipole, we must have a dipole which is 15 centimeter in size. This is kind of, of course, then tricky because we want to really uh, put our tags everywhere. And this should not be maybe that visible. And uh, so definitely also to re reach this high integration that we want to have, we have to miniaturize this antenna. But with, uh, as it is the largest part, as soon as we miniaturize, the efficiency of this antenna gets really bad. And so we definitely have then to deal with a read range reduction. But this you can do with this read range reduction. It, it really depends on what application are you targeting, what are the read range you're targeting, and also what you could do, what you can exploit definitely if you operate at UHF and you want to have a higher a longer communication range, read range, then you could also exploit booster antennas. And I know that yesterday there was a talk on booster antennas and I'll also show some of them today. Um, really depending on the application. And for HF, it's um, really a fraction of a wavelength, the antenna, but you can see it here. Typically it has a credit card size as shown in this tag. And also here, of course, the, 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 poss um, the, the possibility to harvest a lot of power that is provided by the reader I, with a small uh, antenna and a small uh, coil area is then uh, very small. So you definitely also have a read range reduction there at HF. And that is why then typically as soon as we go to miniaturization, you can see some miniaturization examples here on the right side for HF, oh, sorry, for UHF here is an example. Here you have an example for uh, HF and UHF. This is an HF example, so an HF tag using system on, uh, um, a system on chip a coil on chip, sorry for that, coil on chip example. And then you have here a dual band miniaturized tag. These are actually tags that uh, we realized in cooperation with Infineon here, have a size of one square millimeter, but uh, you, I will show you later on some design examples. But definitely you will then go, because uh, for UHF, you cannot think of um, electromag efficient electromagnetic radiation and reception at all. So you go towards near field communication. So as you have this read range reduction, you go towards, okay, now we have to go down in communication range and then rely on inductive coupling using coils or capacitive coupling. 
this is also a possibility. And this example here on the right side is a capacitive couple RFID tag using electrodes then. And uh, you can see it already in the example, what we are exploiting here is system on chip and system in package concepts in CMOS technologies which are then also very favorable in cost. If you take a look at what is out there for RFID tags, and you try to define miniaturization classes, and this we actually did, and we published it in the IEEE Microwave Magazine in 2018. So if you're interested in more details, please take a look at this publication. You can find actually three classes of RFID tags. You have the conventional tags with the conventional size, with dipole antennas for UHF and coil antennas for HF. And they have typically sizes bigger than 200 square millimeter. Now, if you go down in size and exploit, for example, system in package concepts in CMOS, you can realize coil on modules, also called coil on system tags which have, have a size between 200 square millimeter and as small as two square millimeter. And here you can see some examples that uh, we will discuss today, in particular this one later on. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize now the difference, what is a coil on module, what is a coil on system? So a coil on module, you can see it here. This uh, picture I actually took from an Infineon site because Typically, coil on modules are in every credit card that we use, where we have contactless payment included, because we have here then um, this um, connection based, um, let's say the pad for connections if we try to, to, to pay on the terminal with, uh, con with contact. And then here on the back, we have a small coil on this module, and that is why it's called coil on module. And then this is embedded in the substrate material of your credit card. And the small coil is aligned to another pickup coil of the booster antenna. And also in the credit card, then you have this small coupling coil of the booster antenna and then a bigger coil, which helps to establish typical communication ranges in HF or FID. So actually booster antennas, you have it in your credit cards and it's a state-of-the-art technology already. The nice thing about why they use booster antennas, preferably than other antennas, which have a Galvani connection, is um, you do have a more mechanical robust, you have a bigger mechanical robustness in, in terms of you know, consumer handling. So there, no connection can be broken, which is nice, of course. And uh, it's also cheaper actually for the, the production as far as I know. So this is the coil on module and it's a typical RFID chip you have there and the coil on the package on the module. And then on the other side of the module you have this for contact payment stuff. A coil on system is then including additional components. And you can see here this one example, which I discussed later on in details. And there you have, in contrast to a coil, in, to a coil of module, you have more components in there, which create a whole system. For example, a sensor system, where you have a sensor chip included, a communication chip, everything in one package, and done on top of the package, in this case, the coil. Um, these are the differences between coil on system and coil on module. And you can find actually a lot of products already available because here the, the coil size can be quite large still. And with this, you have a robust communication. So it's easier to get a product out there. The, the more um, risky part still, but of course, interesting then for researchers to make it more robust these communication uh, uh, devices go to uh, an even smaller size of the tag. And then you go towards coin on chip and on chip capacitive coupling tags. So OC free tags, we call them. And then you exploit near field communication, a coil on top or electrodes on top and bottom. And here you have this OC free tag, and you can really go down to 
one square millimeter in size. And you have, for example, here this dual band pack, which has a size of 1.3 square millimeter with two coils on the chip. So it's a system on chip uh, packaging uh, uh, concept that we use here for CMOS. So here you get the, the more, um, the most smallest components of, and of course the, the more limited components in communication range. And that's, that's it's currently more risky because you have to uh, put more emphasis on research and RF design here. And uh, of course, very interesting then for, for scientists, as I said. Um, if you now compare the, what are the pros and cons of coil on module, coil on chips, you, you can see here this comparison table where you definitely can say for a coil on module or coil on system tags, which are bigger, you definitely have a higher read range in comparison to coil on chip or OC3 tags. The losses uh, are also not as high in these bigger tags than in the smaller tags. However, the costs are, if you think of comparing, you know, wafer level production for CMOS is definitely higher for the coilon module, coilon system tags, because uh, there you have to rely on another packaging technology, while here you can rely on a, a normal CMOS technology without any packaging data for the coil on chip and OC3 tags. If we now take a look at the genesis of miniaturized tags, so who did it first? What, what were the first uh, uh, inventions? Uh, you can also find this information in more detail in this article I mentioned before. You can uh, see this table here, and it actually started with the fr French Telecom, France Telecom, in 1997 and in 2001, where they first uh, came up with a miniaturized tag, so to say, using a coil on chip. Uh, concept for um, CMOS technology and using, it, as you can see, uh, the a very uh, large CMOS technology from 500, uh, 500 nanometer and 250 nanometer. And the tag area they proposed were four square millimeter and 1.5 square millimeter. And the the frequency they were operating in at the beginning in 97 were 4.9 megahertz, as you can see, and they were not reporting any read range results with their publication. And later on, they proposed already the 13.56 megahertz uh, operating range for these tags. But again, no read range was reported back then. And here you can see this example of OVA. Next one uh, who were dealing with miniaturized tags was Usami with uh, Hitachi in 2003. And uh, he proposed that actually the first OC3 tag, so on-chip capacitive coupled tag in a 118 nanometer CMOS technology, super small area, tag area. So very small, as you can see it here, and a high frequency of 2.45 gigahertz but there was no report on a, on a read range. So I guess no communication could have been established. And uh, then um, if, we go for, if we go forward, we can see then uh, again, a coil on chip example, which was proposed in 2010, uh, six by Chen at ASTAR in Singapore. And they already then reported a read range. And the operator, operating range was 2.45 gigahertz, which is, you know, for RFID, it's, um, you, it's better to stick to the protocols and to the standards, so 13.56 and 860 megahertz. So as, as soon as you go outside these frequency ranges, it's, it's not so interesting for products and companies at all. They were using uh, a post-processing technology to, to establish this coil on, on, top, uh, on top of the chip. And it has a size of 0 0.5 square millimeter. Yeah, and then already uh, 
the researchers, you can see, so the first established range at 2.45 gigahertz, and then researchers got more, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, excited and tried the hardest things to to realize. So they, they got down in frequency, which actually means you you need a a, a high a, a larger antenna. But they thought, okay, now we can do it actually, use a coil on chip concept, 180 nanometer CMOS, area size of 0 0.7 square millimeter. And at 900 megahertz, they were all, uh, already having a better design, establishing then a read range of four millimeter at a lower frequency, which means actually your antenna is even worse. And here you can see the design of Shameli in, at Broadcom Corporation and in, in California. Uh, the university was also included there. And then also in 2011, researchers got even more adventurous and they established, uh, Kim at Nagoya University, established communication 1.5 millimeter freeze range with a 13.56 RFID tag. So which is actually quite neat because here in comparison to the wavelength, your antenna is very, very small. You can see here the sizes. So as you can see that the first um, success was, actu was actually, actually, actually achieved by 2010 around. If you then take a look at, okay, what about coil on module? You can find actually in 2011 a, a publication or an article on Hitachi Chemical they proposed a coil on module with an impinger Monza 5 chip and, and epoxy resign. And the tag area was six square millimeter. Of course, for a coil on module, coil on system, quite, okay, quite nice in an area size because here we expect bigger areas. They established communication at 920 megahertz. And then of course, uh, also then uh, companies got more adventurous. If we can communicate at 920, we can also realize a miniaturized antenna or coil and establish communication at a lower frequency at 13.56 megahertz. And this was then achieved and shown by Murata Manufacturing. You can see it. If they were using a low temperature co-fired co ceramics. And achieved a read range of quite nice 15 uh, square millimeters. So you can definitely see they did a good improve, uh, in, they achieved a good improvement in design. And with respect to what is needed for a good design, I will show you later this design example. In 2014, then, Marta uh, Bakker, a PhD student in my group, uh, in, in cooperation with, with Infineon, and actually proposed the first working OC free tag. So Sami did it for, uh, proposed it first, but reported no read range. Now, we here reported uh, read range with a, an area of one square millimeter. And as we uh, rely on capacitive coupling, we can achieve and use the dual and RFID chip uh, front end. We were able to report at these two frequencies, different read ranges. So at 13.56 megahertz and at 868 megahertz, read ranges of 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 millimeter. And uh, Oh, the Walter was actually a very productive researcher, and he also then came up with the first coil on system because before we only saw coil on module by Itachi and Murata. And now uh, we see the first coil on system, which you can see here, this one. And it's really, it's uh, based on the EW CMOS technology provided by Infineon. I will speak more about that later on. And we achieved here a communication range of 11 millimeter. This I will show you in the design example in more detail. In 2014, uh, we could also report a coil on chip solution in 130 nanometer CMOS technology. Uh, two frequencies, a dual band miniaturized RFID chip and uh, read ranges of 2.5 and 4.4 millimeter respectively. 
So uh, as you can see, a lot of things were achieved actually by Walter, which, and I'm kind of proud to be honest. So let us take a look at this coil on system HFRFID tag that uh, I was uh, referring to. Uh, it's re um, using a 3D embedded wafer level low grid array packaging technology provided by Infineon in Regensburg, Germany. And here you can see it's, it's the EWLP packaging technology. And if you want to get more details on this technology, please uh, read this publication here. And uh, this coilon system tag was actually uh, realized for biomedical applications. So for point of care testing, as you can see it on the top right picture with this HF RFID reader and the coilon system tag, there you have a sensing uh, device on top, the sensing array, as you can see it here on this figure on the right side on the bottom, you have this sensing array, then you have the biochip, a tunnel magnetoresistant sensor CMOS biochip to uh, detect marked biomolecules. And you have the HFRFID chip for communication. You have some vertical contacts, which was also quite new to uh, nice then to achieve such vertical contacts in such a pack packaging technology. And then uh, you have this coil antenna which was of course perfectly designed to meet the desires for a good, to establish a good communication. And uh, the, the ASIC was relying on the 14443 HF RFID standard. So for system design of these coil on chip or coil on system text, you definitely have always to take into account the whole system, reader and tech. And what you do is you start typically with the tag. So, uh, and you try then to optimize, uh, uh, first of all, on the tag side, which can be shown as by an equivalent circuit of a resistance and a capacitance. And this is modeling and chip and the chip front end. And uh, here you can see the numbers for the parallel capacitance of the chip, which is 56 picofarad. And for the resistance of the chip, which uh, varies between 40 ohm and 8 kilo ohm. What you have to keep here in mind is as we rely on load modulation, we are changing the resistance value to communicate logic one and logic zero of the HFRFID transponder right T. So this resistance value varies with modulation, but also with shunt regulation. So typically as the, the CMOS technology that you're using can only handle a certain amount of voltage and otherwise above this voltage circuitries get destroyed, you try to also protect your chip circuitry by having such a shunt regulation. So as, as soon too much power is coming from the reader or is available at the tech antenna uh, output, you try to get rid of this power and shunt everything down. So you try to reflect as much power as possible and to not destroy your circuit. So this you have to keep in mind for, for the chip, you have this parallel uh, equivalent circuit, and then you design the coil. And for this, you also have a parallel equivalent, uh, a, a equivalent circuit with inductance of the coil modeled by this inductor, with, of, with the losses in the coil modeled by this resistance, and capacitive coupling modeled between the coil bindings modeled by this uh, capacitance here in parallel. This, as you can see it here, is a very simplified uh, coil model. This is, you could use it very well for coil on system, coil on modules, and also for bigger coils. For coil on chip models, uh, chips to model this, I would definitely suggest to go to more sophisticated models, which you know already from the RFIC designers. If you take a look at it, they do have a lot of um, 
different uh, coil models available and I would go for this because then you have also coupling with the with silicon and uh, definitely have to take care of this. Here in this case, the model is definitely sufficient to do this. And uh, why we are actually using here equivalent circuits is it's more time efficient to then do the design rather than to know to, to go in uh, electromagnetic simulators, which would take ages to get to a solution. So you definitely go first to an equivalent circuit to establish, okay, what kind of coil do I need here? Which parameters I need? And on the reader side, you actually have it too. You have then the net matching network and the reader chip. Um, here you have to get to know all these numbers and then you can design uh, the tech coil, what you have to achieve and what we uh, saw for having, uh, saw for getting this tech resonance at 13.56 megahertz is we, we got into the design of, um, we got this design values of 2.33 microhenry and uh, a coil capacitance of 2.45 picofarad and a resistance of 34 ohm. And then uh, you try to go again, of course, to an electromagnetic simulator, for example, CSD or um, ADS. They have this two, or yes, they have this two dimensional, two and a half dimensional uh, simulator, which you can use. And then you can go for, you know, how should the coil look like to achieve these parameters? And then we got these 19 windings and track and gap width of 20 micrometers. Of course, what you have to take into account when you do this design is also the uh, package that you use and the permittivity, the relative permittivity of the package, as you also do it with you know, planar antennas on PCBs. So um, we, had, we had the design and the size then of this prototype was uh, 5.6 times 3.6 times 0 0.7 millimeter. And here you can see, you have here the sensing array, uh, below you have embedded in the, uh, in the packaging material, you have the bio chip and, and the communication chip. And on the other side, you do see the coil antenna. And uh, of course, you want to establish then and show that your design is good. You want to establish read range uh, measure, uh, measurement and communication with the reader. And here you can see uh, very quickly the, the, the setup of the reader device. Here is the an, an coaxial cable in. We have here this HF matching network to achieve this 50 ohm and matching with the HF RFID reader coil. And then we were able with a one watt reader output power and the conventional reader to have a maximum read range, uh, to achieve a maximum read range of 11 millimeter. Now you'd say mm, 11 millimeter, uh, it, it might be cool now for, you know, for certain applications, but what if I would go for a vicinity standard tag and would like applications where I need a higher communication range like up to one meter, and then you would do a read range extension using these booster antennas. And here on the video, I hope you see it. I did click the button for an optimized video transfer to you, but I hope you see it. You can see, for example, you could embed this tag in a tissue and then uh, use a reader antenna, adjust the reader antenna with the coupling coil of the reader antenna with the tag coil accordingly and then read out, for example, here in this case, the identification number and also the temperature, which is very interesting. As I said before, it's, it's nice to use these booster antennas because you do have a mechanical robustness and also reduce costs, which is very cool. Um, if you think of, yeah, what about uh, a robust operation maybe in, in, in metal environments, because what we want to achieve is always a robust operation in any, in any kind of environment that we put our devices in. And you would go to uh, an HF RFID repeater maybe, if you have a tag enclosed in a metal environment, as you can see it here in this video, we 
activities together with industry partners, NXP, Semiconductors here in Austria, and AVL, which is an automotive supplier. And they have this specific, very uh, uh, flagship sensor component, Hydron, to, to measure um, sophisticated um, sensing information. And it's enclosed in a metal environment. And so what we propose to read out a tag, which is in such a metal environment, uh, metal in how and closing to use a repeater, which consists of two booster antennas and ferrite sheets and a flux guide. So here you have this sensing device, which is a coil on the back, again, ferrite material to put it on metal environment. And we have an NXD product, which is actually a sensor product. So it's an HF RFID tag, which allows us to connect a, a sensor. And we used here a metal switch, which reacts on temperature. So we could temperature threshold monitoring. And uh, we put it in there in this enclosed in housing uh, and, and in this metal uh, closure. And then uh, you attach the, the, the repeater. And the repeater is these two poster antennas on one side and on the other side, you only need a small hole. Uh, hole. And it, through this hole, you do put your flux guide and then you can actually read out your HF RFID sensor tag, which is very neat, of course, to have this robust operation. If you want to take a closer look at the specifics and how we designed this, uh, repeater, which you can see here, it's on one side and the other side is then outside the metal housing to read out with this mobile phone, the sensor data. You can take a look at this publication here at the IEEE uh, antennas and wave propagation levels. Now, um, another thing I want to, to to mention and I already did is this uh, sensing. Uh, so also not only you know to, to have uh, for RFID it was mostly only identification so it would be really nice to also have some sensing included in a battery less device. So imagine you have then battery less wireless IoT nodes which you can put into your house, into your cities, into the production factories, which would be very beneficial to get rid of this ecotoxicity of batteries. So that is why we are also focusing a lot on this. And uh, I do see that uh, this video on the right is uh, not transferred very nice. You can see it not so nice. Okay. It's, it's actually, again, this uh, RFID tag for HF RFID, where we, where we use this NXP product. Another thing, of course, is not only to, to, to use, for example, dedicated chips, but also maybe um, state-of-the-art RFID chips with only identification on top of it with no additional sensor device, and then uh, to, to use antenna-based sensing. So let me go further. Uh, because what you could actually do when you take a look at the how these RFID systems look at UHF, for example, then you have backscatter communication. At the tag, again, you have the antenna and the chip, and the chip can then be modeled by impedances. One impedance in the absorbing mode, where the chip half its power, and another impedance in the reflecting mode, where the chip typically tries to achieve a huge mismatch with the, with the antenna and then reflect a lot of power back. By this, you can realize actually uh, uh, amplitude modulation, so the backscatter modulation, and you can communicate logical zero and logical one. So, but what if, if we want to put some sensing data in there. So what we could do is we could try to bring in some uh, sensing material in there, or we could do an extra sensor interface, but I want to get rid of this sensor interface anyhow. So I would like to use materials. So to be very efficient in, in sensing in terms of what I use as, as a device. But uh, what's definitely 
always uh, often seen in in research is that you could use the antenna actually as a sensor because the antenna as it is a dipole antenna reacts very strongly to your environment so wouldn't it be neat to have an rfid tech which in uses the antenna as a sensor and then you know achieves both identification and sensing and it's a battery less device so what, what we actually proposed, and you will see that later on also researchers all over the world were, are working on this, is to realize an additional modulation in amplitude of phase of the backscatter tech signal with additional impedance states. And this you can use by, for example, using antenna rest sensor. Here you can see um, so-called antenna transducer. And here you can see some application. You have the reader, you do say RFID, um, RF data and power towards the tag that is, for example, mounted on an infusion bag. And you would try to then find out, okay, when is the bag, this infusion bag empty? When do I have to refill it? And then to uh, report it back to the system so that the nurse can come and uh, that uh, it can change the, the infusion bag. And you put an, a, a, an RFID tag, in this case, not a miniaturized one, but it would be definitely cool to have a miniaturized one here too, uh, on this bag to, to do this water filling level sensing and use the antenna. So with the water level psi, your antenna impedance changes. And uh, what's then the problem is, uh, what you've seen also in literature is, what you have to achieve or challenges you have to, to, to uh, reach is you want to have, of course, a proper wireless power transfer towards the passive chip. And um, this is definitely um, necessary uh, to, to have a, a proper impedance matching in the absorbing mode. So you, you should definitely see that if you have, if you use the antenna as a the sensing device that you do not deviate too much from an optimal impedance which you need to harvest enough power because if you have not enough power at the chip you will not communicate any information no identification number no sensing information also what you have is the setup dependence of your systems and you want to get independent of the setup if you think of the reader and the tag changes in distance, you have typically then also an effect on the backscattered signal. And if the information and the information lies in the backscattered signal of the sensing information, it's included in there, then it gets also changed. So you have a problem there. And you definitely see it in the genesis of passive UHF RFID sensor tags that uh, people were struggling with this a lot. It started in 2009 using amplitude modulation, but we're not achieving a high wireless power transfer. And uh, we're not set up independent at all. And then slowly but gradually set up independence were included using amplitude modulation. And in 2004, uh, I was already in class. I proposed to use amplitude and phase modulation to get at, le to get at least a high wireless power transfer all the time. And you can see the prototype here. But we were not achieving set up independence yet. This we achieved then in 2018, where we again use amplitude and phase modulation and achieved high wireless power transfer and set up independence. And uh, how did we achieve this actually? By introducing signal pattern based sensor tags. So rather than to relay sensor information as this water filling level only to uh, certain points in, in, in your signal constellation diagram, which you receive at the, uh, at the reader, then you, you, you relate it to a signal pattern. And if you see a signal pattern, a certain one, you can then relate this to a sensing state. And uh, as time is running by a little bit, I have to uh, keep up my pace here. Uh, but definitely, if you're interested, please take a look at this publication, the UHF RFID sensor systems using tech signal patterns, the prototype systems, which we published in 
at IEEE antennas and wave propagation level. Essentially, what we proposed is to use a certain pattern and to keep within a certain wireless power transfer, to have always this high wireless power transfer available. And uh, if you take then a look at the uh, uh, at the receiver and the signal constellation diagram there, you still have, of course, your identification number, which is communicated. But on top of that, you have a, a, an amplitude and phase modulation, which allows you then to recognize a certain pattern if you change the filling level that you want to monitor. So if you change the sensor level. So if we start with a full filling level here at 100 millimeter, and then the filling level decreases, you will see a certain pattern in the signal constellation diagram. Here you have the real and imaginary part of the scattered signal directly at the tech. And here you have the signal diagram, this in-phase component, quadrature phase component at the reader receiver. And you see it here, we, we have uh, the full filling level, then the filling level decreases and decreases, and then before it's super empty, the infusion pack, we do the, see this peak. And as soon as we do see this peak, we start to see this peak, we can uh, reckon, okay, now we do have to refill this infusion pack, so that's, that is necessary. And what we proposed here is, okay, um, is the water can to detect if a binary sending state. So is the, the infusion pack full or is it empty? But what you could also think of to get an additional sensor state in there so that you have, for example, that you recognize immediate, very soon, okay, the infusion bag is already now half full. Uh, so it's soon, empty, soon getting empty and then we can detect this. But this was the, the first, hmm, prototype that we're showing here. And uh, the nice thing about this, we, we don't only assure that we have a viol high wireless power transfer at the tech, which needs the power from the reader, but we are also set up independent because take a look at the signal uh, constellation diagram for different distances of 0 0.5 meter, one meter, for example, and 1.5 meter. And then you can see you have, you can always see this pattern. It really does not depend if there is a variation in, in distance between reader and tech. And that's so cool. Of course, um, what you also have to think of is um, to how to test these devices. Uh, because as a researcher, you propose something, but you also want to, to test it quite fast. So what we also presented to the research community is then a reader test bed we were, where we were able to detect um, signal amplitude and signal phase, which is important, of course, for detect an additionally amplitude and phase modulated backscatter signal. And we also did some dependability investigations on uh, how uh, can, can we really detect the state of uh, the water filling level in a canister or in an effusion bag, always. So what we established was a lot of measurements and using a lot of different locations also for the canister to be sure uh, we could also then, for example, perform localization still. Because for localization, you also need the phase information that is backscattered of your backscattered text signal at the reader. And is this phase modulation that we are introducing kind of disturbing this, uh, this detection of or this localization algorithms that we apply? This was also, of course, a, a question that we raised. But definitely what we experienced for the dependability investigations that we were able to always detect the sensor state and the signal pattern that we were looking for. We had 24 measurements. And also here you can see the simulations results in the signal constellation diagram. And for the localization, we were also here, you can see the, the localization of these canisters when we put it, uh, for example, here on this, 
on this position or on this position, on this position, and still perform sensing and the change in water filling level. And as you can see, in, in, in terms of, you know, this small bandwidth localization that we perform with these four reader antennas with this small band, uh, in the small band system, uh, we are still good in being able to detect then the, the angle of arrival and using this phase differences in all this, of all these different antennas here. So to conclude, just in time, as I see, uh, we do have, uh, what I uh, showed to you are today RF design solutions for miniaturized wireless IoT nodes to solve sustainability issues on environmental and economic level. And this we try by providing an ultra low, by using an ultra low power communication technology, in this case, RFID. But what you could also use is, for example, a sub one gigahertz uh, ISM band system, which is often used to, in these ultra low power uh, IoT nodes, and definitely ultra low power is the most important thing, I guess, to get rid of the batteries at all would be the best. And also another uh, theme that we are going for to achieve uh, sustainability, to have this high level of integration to reduce the carbon footprint of the devices. And I showed you a one design example, how you can achieve a proper antenna design for such a miniaturized IoT node. And uh, we, we still have many challenges to go towards solving sustainability. And definitely I, I showed you the, to, to have a high miniaturization, include passive sensing without the battery, of course, with a limited amount of sensor data then, but uh, what's definitely then also necessary if we introduce all these means to of integration of including sensing information, then uh, in a battery-less device, it's also necessary, of course, to provide a robust operation. And I showed you one design example for a metal environment and also for a non-body communication system. And also what's important is rapid testing. You need to test your devices very rapidly or your sensor methods that you, you propose and in particular in the specific applications environment to be sure that you can provide dependability because that's necessary. We cannot, you know, no one would choose sustainability if, or these sustainable solutions if your system is not properly working. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request James, our student volunteer, to take charge of the Q&A round. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, one of the questions that you received is, is that uh, quite a lot of research work exists in the area of ultra low power. So what are the probable future scope of research? With respect to ultra low power? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I said, uh, very important is as soon as you go to ultra low power and for example, for a battery less operation, you definitely have to make sure that you have a proper communication, a proper wireless communication. So this is something that we definitely have to care about because otherwise no one would, would choose ultra low power communication devices. And we would, of course, try to reach a dependable com wireless communication also in severe environments where we have metal or harsh environments where we have metal included, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, my thinking is always, you know, for this, as we cannot beat physics, we cannot beat it. Uh, what what we maybe can do to, to, to realize reliable and dependable wireless communication links for such devices is to exploit new advances from a proposed by computer scientists. And here I'm really looking forward to what they will uh, introduce to us with respect to tiny AI. 
because tiny AI, tiny artificial intelligence is a trend in computer science where they try to use um, AI algorithms also in very uh, low power devices. So they have a very power efficient algorithms they're proposing. And it would be my vision to use these algorithms then also later on in ultra low power devices to achieve, for example, some kind of a cognitive radio or software defined radio, where we can then always achieve a dependable and wireless communication. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So another one question we have received is, uh, how is interference between two RFID readers taken care of? Uh, pardon me, interference what? Uh, interference between two RFID readers. How will it be taken care of? Ah, yes. Um, uh, typically, you try to set up your systems like this, that um, you have, you know, in a certain room, one RFID reader, which then covers the, certain, the complete room. And then in the other room, you maybe have another reader which covers that room. And... Uh, it's, I, I wouldn't say that there is any interference because what a reader is doing, it's sending, you know, RF data, which is beneficial for every tech to harvest this data, this power. So it's harvesting power from the reader. And on the other side, um, the reader is sending out specific data to wake up the tags in the area and to read out the sensor and uh, uh, the sensor state or the identification number. And as with the, and so the, the tag backscattered, it could also be that a, then a tag maybe wakes up in the neighboring room and backscatters back and the, re receive, uh, the reader receiver then receives this signal. But uh, still, as you do know the identification number and you have, can have in the background in the, in, of your system, have a lookup table, which identification um, number should be in which room, you can definitely take care of this. Of course, if you try to localize measurement devices and these measurement devices can be in one room or in the other room, and you would like to know in which room it is exactly, it, it's not helping when you receive uh, one ID and uh, both readers, I guess. So here you would try to maybe establish then kind of, um, I would say do it like this, establish some kind of localization where you localize, for example, the angle of arrival or the, the distance from the tag and then uh, take a look at the system. What is the, you know, the circumference of your room? And is it possible, physical possible that the tag is in this room? If the tag reflects, for example, from an angle where it's impossible, it can be located within this room. Okay, so another question is, uh, you had explained about the miniaturization of passive RFID sensors. So can miniaturization be included in case of active sensors as well? If yes, then what is the compromise? Yeah, yeah miniaturization can be uh, included everywhere. So uh, also, uh, there are also, for example, with respect to RFID, there are active RFID tags, but then of course it's, uh, uh, the battery less is gone and, also here you have to take care of, um, of, let's say like this, what I showed to you is in specific, how to adjust the antenna to the tag, for example, the miniaturized antenna to the tag impedance that is available. Or, uh, so uh, you also have to do this for an active tag or for an active sensor device. But in this case, it, would, it will be most likely 50 ohm you're targeting then. But, yeah, there, there is no difference in if you miniaturize an antenna for passive or active tags or active devices. Uh, okay, so one question is, uh, what is the lifespan for such devices? For the 
RFID tags without yes. the battery. You have uh, um, a, a lo very long lifespan, though, because the, the only thing that could happen is if, you know, for if you have a mechanical damage, then you have a problem. But otherwise, you're good to go as long as the building stands. OK. Uh, so another question is, uh, how would you increase the read range for RFID devices? So um, for these miniaturized ones, I showed it to you. So you're typically doing, um, you use booster antennas if the application allows it. So um, I, I can show you a slide on that. I have a backup slide here. Let me move to this one. Well, you, maybe it's done a little, a little bit nicer to see. So here you can see actually what you do for the miniaturized stuff because uh, for conventional tags, you typically have to read range that you're targeting for and uh, definitely uh, an ultra low power, so let, let's say it like this, RFID is not established to achieve very long communication distances. I'd say it's, if you are in a good communication environment for UHF, it could be 20 meters, maybe a little bit more, but, but not more than that. That's, that's the nature of the passive communication technology here. For miniaturized devices, what you can do is actually, for uh, HF as well as UHF, use the accordingly booster antennas. So here you have this OC free tag using on chip capacitive coupling. And there, of course, you have an electrode on top and on the bottom of the chip. So you use two booster antennas. And here you have HF RFID booster antennas where you have coil sizes. And of course, these coils are specifically designed to couple efficiently to this chip. So there is impedance matching performed. Also, uh, if you have inductively coupled tags, uh, you've seen it in the video already where I had a tag on the, body, on the human body. And you have a small coupling coil here and uh, you try to adjust them the tag properly. So here you have to take care of adjustment of the coupling. Also, of course, here, but here you have a, a coupling coil and then a connection to a larger coil, which is then boosting up the communication technology, uh, the communication range. You could do the same thing for UHF, but then the booster antenna would be a dipole, of course. Here it's for the OC free tag. Here we have again these two parts of a booster antenna to couple to the two electrodes on the chip. And here it's a uh, an inductively coupled RFID tag where you place then uh, uh, specifically this coupling coil connected to your typo antenna to the, to the, to the, um, uh, exactly on the chip. Yeah, so that's with the questions, ma'am. So thank you so much for answering all the questions. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of the participants, I would like to thank Dr. Jasmine Grossinger for sharing with us her vast experience in the field of RFID technologies and for emphasizing the significance of miniaturization and RF design solutions for solving sustainability issues in 5G. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking out time from your busy schedule to be with us. Wish you a great day and a happy weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, ma'am, a request. Ma'am, is it possible for you to share the slides with the team? It will be actually helpful to the students. Yes, I, I can send you the slides. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the invitation and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jasmine, uh, can we please request you to stay back? We are uh, having a valedictory ceremony right now. And we would also have a photograph with you and all the participants. So. Yes, I, I will wait. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, friends, the journey 
of two half-day symposium on 5G, a catalyst to digital revolution, have finally come to an end. Each one of us as participants and organizing team has definitely gained a lot of useful information and a different perspective of fight. We would like to thank our college management for giving us the permission to conduct the symposium on behalf of IEEE MTTS students chapter. I thank each one of the distinguished speakers for letting time from their busy schedule and conducting the talk in the best of the possible way. I would also like to thank each one of the participants for participating in this symposium. We do expect that they definitely have gained a lot of knowledge from these series of talks. I would like to request the participants if they have any feedback, they can share on this forum. So do unmute yourself and you can share your feedback. Mute. Yes, any participants would like to share a verbal feedback uh, apart from the one that you have filled? Yes. Okay, so now I would request our HOD, Dr. Ashwini Kotra Shetty, to make the concluding remarks. Also, the participants are requested to switch on their camera for a group photo after the address by uh, Dr. Rashmi. Over to you, Ashwini. Ma. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, before I thank everybody, I would like to summarize the two-day symposium that we had. So we began the symposium with a very small uh, and a brief formal uh, inauguration uh, session, after which we had a talk on 5G new radio point-to-point -point systems by Mr. Hermes Joel, which gave us insights on point-to-point -point radio architecture, the design aspects and field installations. The talk also gave us information on practical antennas that are used for uh, 5G along with point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint applications. Our session two by Dr. Jo uh, Joma Anguera was on 5G perspective in design of IoT devices embedding antenna boosters. This interesting talk introduced us to antenna booster technology and provided physical insights on how to design wireless devices like uh, IoT, embedding antenna boosters and covering uh, from single band to multi-band applications, either using passive or uh, active matching network um, uh, within the architectures. Now, uh, the session three was a very refreshing talk by, uh, by Dr. Asairaj, uh, Sai Deeraj Omuru, and uh, the talk was on present Indian perspective on 5G, and he gave us insights on efforts taken by Indian technology community towards ensuring that 5G standards are suitable for deployments in rural and urban India, which is a matter of great pride to all of us. Dr. Amaru made a very striking point, and I quote, if we do not put forth our ideas in front of international community, the technology will never be inclusive of our country. And I think he's very right on this point. He also discussed the research initiatives and opportunities towards 5G technology and assured that India is not just prepared for 5G, or I should say with IG, but Research and planning on 6G has also begun. And a uh, last session, and I think it was extremely enriching session on RF design for ultra low power wireless communication in next generation 5G 
IoT devices by Dr. Jasmine Gosinger. Uh, Madam explained in this session the development of miniaturized IoT nodes that need to operate in harsh environments. And uh, the session also provided insights on how issues between IoT sensors and 5G deployments can be resolved in mass deployment conditions. And uh, she explained very well the need for efficient miniaturizing of components and uh, so as to improve the ultra low power operation of IoT nodes, um, you know, uh, with environment uh, being ta uh, taken care of. Dr. Jasmine also discussed with us so uh, solutions uh, for robust ultra low power wireless communication uh, based on high frequency and ultra high frequency RFID technologies. So uh, these were four very interesting and enriching sessions that we um, um, went through in past two days. And uh, I think we look forward for many such symposiums, uh, which can be um, uh, you know, organized by any of the um, communities around us. So with this, I would like to formally thank all our speakers who have uh, been very gracious and have accepted our invitation to be part of the symposium. They are eminent people uh, in their domains of uh, work. And I would also like to thank our management of Don Bosco Institute of Technology for supporting us in this uh, endeavor. I would like to extend my thanks to all my faculty colleagues who have been part of this uh, symposium and also the uh, volunteers who have made the symposium po uh, possible. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all you participants for uh, uh, being present and carefully listening to the uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, we sign off from Don Bosco Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, for this uh, time, we will see you back again very soon with a very, very interesting symposium once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashwini Ma, uh, for the brief overview of the symposium. Yes, again, I would request any feedback the participants would like to share. Please unmute yourself and you can share it. Sure, ma'am. Like, I would like to say something. Am I audible? Yes, sir. yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, I think this symposium was, um, it gave us a lot of insights on 5G and about, you know, the India's journey, like, um, the session from Dr. Saidi Raksa and the Hermes Royal, all the sessions. I think it, they gave a lot of insights about the 5G and it was definitely one of the I think best events conducted by ITP till now because I personally enjoyed them a lot. And once again, I would like to thank the faculties who have, you know, have taken a lot of, I could see like how much efforts we had put in this. So it, I think it was definitely worth it. And thank you all the students for joining us. And yeah, that's it, ma'am. Thank you, Ajita. Anybody thank else? You. Okay, so participants, it's a request that switch on your camera so that we can uh, take a group photo. Students, participants, please switch on the camera. They say they are not able to turn on the camera. I think uh, the host, please do the video. Yes, ma'am. Ajita, to unmute, I guess. No, no, unmute is taken care. 
Okay. Yeah, allow participants to start video. Yes, it has been enabled. Yeah. Sorry for that. <laughs> Ajita, who is taking the click? I am taking There are two pages. Okay. Thank you, Ajita. It's done? Yeah, thank you, Ajita. Yes. Okay, so with this, we come to the end of the validatory session and the end of the symposium. So I thank you once again. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. And we do uh, expect that we conduct more such symposium and you again attend it.